that being said, uh, let's get started. Oh. All right, perfect. So um, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Glenn Nuninghoff. I am the Associate Director of Operations on the MBA admissions staff at Georgetown. Uh, so we support the full-time Flex and Flex Online MBA programs. Uh, ultimately, same degree, just different formatting. Um, our full-time MBA program being your standard full-time MBA program where you forego your job for two years uh, and you become a full-time student uh, with the exception of a summer internship between your first and second year. Um, our Flex and uh, Flex Online programs uh, are so our flex, uh, our flex program is uh, for those who uh, are based in Washington, D.C. or plan to move to Washington, D.C. and uh, work full time during the day and primarily take their classes in the evenings on a, on a part time basis with the options of taking some uh, hybrid uh, type of courses where you can take some classes uh, on campus and some that are might be pre recorded, as well as some like Saturday electives as well. But uh, ultimately, you have a, a bit more flexibility as far as how long you you you, you complete that degree, anywhere from a little over two years to, to five years. Uh, but ultimately, you're working full time and, and uh, obtaining a uh, MBA on a part time basis, primarily in the evenings. Uh, and then the same thing goes with the Flex Online program, which uh, we just launched. Uh, it will really mirror the the Flex program in that. Majority of the classes will be held online. Um, you have a lot of the same resources as you would for the full-time program as well. Um, but really the main difference is that rather than your classes being in person, your classes will be online, um, taking the same exact classes with the same sets of professors. And um, ultimately you, you have the same flexibility as well, where you can finish the, the degree anywhere from a little over two years to five years. And um, you're just like a flex, uh, MBA student who is coming to campus uh, for classes. Uh, you are also working full time during the day and taking classes in the evenings, except uh, in more more so in an online setting. Uh, but anyways, each of these programs begins in the fall of each year. So if you're looking to submit an application for the fall 2023 um, or for our fall 2023 program start, uh, I hope this application workshop is, is helpful for you. Uh, but if you're looking to apply in a future admission cycle, say like for a fall 2024 uh, program start, a lot of this information is still going to be applicable. There might be some tweaks here or there, um, but ultimately should still be relatively applicable. And then uh, as far as the layout of, of what I'll be talking about today, just from a timing perspective, I'll spend about 45 minutes on, on this presentation, really going over um, various uh, application requirements. And I'll try to save the last 15 minutes or so for any sort of uh, Q&A. So if you have any sort of questions throughout the presentation, feel free to enter those into the Q&A box. Uh, and I'm happy to get to those uh, at the end of the, uh, of the presentation, so. All right, so uh, the holistic approach. So um, when we are reviewing applications, uh, we have to take a holistic approach to it, knowing that applicants are coming from various, various different backgrounds, everywhere from different undergraduate institutions attended, uh, different majors uh, that people pursued, uh, different work experience backgrounds, different gears of work experience. Uh, I'll talk about this later, but we have a very wide range of, of, of students that come from you know, only two years out of their bachelor's degree to you know, 15, even 15 plus. So um, ultimately all of our, our, our applicants are coming from various different backgrounds, which makes my job interesting and fun. Uh, but we have to understand that everyone's coming from different backgrounds and uh, we don't have to, we, we can't put certain weightages on particular applicant application components. Uh, ultimately, we have to review every single component of the application before we can really make a determination as far as what if we want to admit this person or uh, or not, or put them on the wait list, or wherever the case may be. So, uh, and we break these out into qualitative and quantitative measures. And uh, first I'll talk about uh, quantitative. So uh, looking at academic history. So First and foremost, uh, the stats on, that you see on the left are from our most recent incoming class, uh, which are comparable year over year. I've been with the team for about six years now. Uh, our average GPA every single year seems to be about a 3.3. Uh, this past year, we actually saw a spike and it's a, it's a 3.4 GPA. And, um, and this is across all programs, both full-time and flex. 
And again, uh, our Flex Online program has not started yet. Uh, it will launch in, um, uh, our first cohort is set to start in, in the fall of 2023. So um, we have no stats to report on that. But um, as far as uh, defining what these GPAs are exactly too, is uh, uh, these are all undergraduate GPAs uh, from U.S. schools that operate on a 4.0 scale, uh, which is most schools in the U.S. So, uh, for example, uh, schools, you know, transcripts that we see receive from, you know, countries outside of the U.S. are not factored into these numbers at all. Uh, and as far as what we you'll be required to submit in your application uh, and everything I'm about to mention, like moving forward, there's going to be specific instructions on these application components, not only on our website, but in the application specifically. So a uh, quick side tangent, if you, for any, any program that you're applying to, whether it's an MBA program or other master's program at any different school, um, a good piece of advice I would share and many other schools share as well is um, if you're considering applying somewhere, start an application early. You don't need to submit it. Uh, you don't need to fill out all the required fields immediately or anything like that, but just get a general understanding of what is going to be required of you and how long it, you know, it's going to take for you to complete those items. Uh, so you're not caught off guard when ap an application deadline approaches and you know that you only have, you know, a day or two to write an essay. So an example to give you, um, we wouldn't want you to, let's say, start an application for a particular program. It doesn't have to be ours, any program. And you go through it one by one, very diligently. Uh, one by one mean like section by section, diligently. And you, uh, there's a day before the application uh, deadline and you realize, holy smokes, there is a required essay that is like 500 words long. I haven't started thinking about these prompts or anything like that. So um, basically we don't want you to be caught in that type of situation where you're rushing in your essays or anything like that. So. Um, Another side tangent too, the best set of advice for anyone as far as uh, when to apply, and I'll talk about like rounds of admission later, um, is to apply when you're ready. So, you know, you don't want your recommendation uh, to be to be rushed. You don't want to rush your essays or anything like that. Definitely apply when, when you feel that you're ready. So all that being said, plan ahead, start applications early for any program that you're applying to. Get a general understanding of what is required of you and then kind of game plan from there. Um, so with that aside, as far as what we require from our applicants in regards to academic history, so you'll be required to submit transcripts as well as uh, the grade scales that go along with those transcripts from all of your undergraduate level education and beyond. Um, so so one, one exception is that we don't need any uh, transcripts from high school or anything prior to that. Uh, I know that many undergraduate uh, transcripts might have AP credits, uh, so classes that transferred in from high school into your undergraduate institution. Uh, we don't need to see how you performed in those classes in high school. However, um, we do need to see the classes you earned in the, in the class, sorry, the classes that you took and the grades that you earned from any other transfer credits. Uh, so that could be, uh, you did your first year at a community college and um, uh, then you transferred into a four-year university or you did a, uh, you know, a study abroad and, uh, uh, you know, in your junior year, your sem the spring semester of your junior year. Uh, so it's really important that we see each class and each grade that you earned while you were in, you know, your undergraduate career. So what I mean, mean my grades too, and a common common mistake I see in, in submitted transcripts is that, let's say you studied abroad for a semester, uh, the classes that you took are included on the transcript, uh, but the grade that is listed is either not there or the grade listed is, uh, says CR or T. CR standing for credit, T meaning for transfer. Um, it's good to know that you pass those courses, um, but ultimately to get a holistic view of how you performed academically and to really get an understanding of your academic history, we wanna understand what grade that you earned. So um, for the most part, these will be letter grades for, for most institutions. So uh, did you earn an A? Did you earn an A minus? Did you earn a B plus, et cetera? Uh, and that's also really important as to why we require grade scales as well. So we understand how your, the, the scale in which your, your grades are, are, are assessed on. So um, happy to address any specific questions about that if you have any in, in the Q&A box. Uh, if you have any, feel free to put them in the Q&A box. Um, 
So beyond just undergraduate level education, uh, we also want to see any sort of master's level transcripts are, uh, that you may have, um, any sort of master's level degrees that you may have pursued, even certificate programs as well. So even if you, you know, you did a semester of a master's program, then you draw, and then you decided to withdraw from it, um, we'll want to see the transcripts as well as the grade skill from that, that particular school. Uh, and as far as what we're looking for in the transcripts themselves, uh, your final GPA is very important. Um, hence why we have these stats that you see on the left. Uh, and while that is really important and we do take value in that when reviewing any application, um, we also wanna look at things like academic progression and trends and also quantitative classes that you're taking too. Um, quantitative classes, for example, everyone's coming from different backgrounds and everybody will have a varying uh, amount of quantitative type classes that you've taken. Um, but if you've taken multiple quantitative classes uh, and you performed well in them, that is great because ultimately that gives us uh, as an admissions committee uh, confidence that you will be able to handle the quantitative rigor of the MBA program when you when you come into the program. So ultimately, when we're looking at these transcripts and other uh, you know application components, we want to ensure that we are setting up you know stu potential future students for for success. And um, this is just one measure that we take to to ensure that we have the confidence in the student that or in this in the applicant that if they were to become a student they would be able to um, you know, handle the quantitative rigor of the program. Um, and then uh, back to the GPA, just you know, evaluating beyond the final GPA is really important because we see this all the time where a uh, GPA might be below our typical averages. Uh, they perform really, really well. Let's say their, their first two years of college, junior year, they, they, their, their grades tank. And then in their senior year, their, their grades, you know, go back to what they were from their freshman and sophomore year. Um, so there's only so much a transcript can tell you. So this goes for this specific type of example, but really what I'm, what I'm about to share really goes for any area of your application where you feel that you need to share any sort of context that we wouldn't otherwise know. Uh, know. So using this as an example, let's say your grades tanked in your junior year. Your transcript's not gonna tell you what was going on in your personal life, what was going on in your family life, what was going on academically, anything like that. So if you feel that is really important for us to know why your grades suffered in that particular year, write a brief optional essay, just providing any sort of context that might be helpful for us. You can share as much or as little as you'd like. Ultimately, as an admissions committee, we just don't wanna be left guessing uh, as to why you performed you know, poorly. Because um, if we don't have any sort of context, then, uh, you know, all we see are our poor grades and that's what we have to you know, evaluate them for. So uh, some, some common examples I've seen of optional essays like this, uh, I've seen essays where people explain that, you know, they've had to work full-time as a full-time student to support their family and themselves financially, which affected their grades. I've read optional essays where, you know, people gone through some sort of health issue that really affected them in the classroom and took them out of class for, you know, long stretches of time. So things like that, um, your transcript is not going to tell you or is not going to tell anybody. So, um, and there's nothing wrong with writing these optional essays too. Ultimately, it, it just provides us context so we can understand why you performed the way that you did. And it's really helpful for us. So, and, and it, it can be very helpful for you too. So, we can evaluate beyond just your final GPA, let's say if it's like below, uh, you know, our, our typical averages, for example. So uh, test scores. So um, again, stats on the left are from our most recent incoming class. So they're comparable year over year. Uh, we accept the GMAT, GRE, and the executive assessment for all of our programs. Uh, we do not have a preference over which test that you take. Ultimately, um, the test that we, we we recommend that you take the test that you feel most comfortable taking. Uh, you're welcome to take uh, multiple tests. You could take the GMAT multiple times. You could take the GMAT once and the GRE once, whatever works for you. Um, ultimately, we don't have a preference over which test that you take. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the MBA program has, you know, you know, definitely a high level of quantitative rigor everywhere from accounting classes to, to statistics classes. So standardized tests is a great way to really show off your quantitative ability, um, particularly if you, you know, you didn't, take many quantitative courses, let's say in your undergraduate career or, or uh, you know, any, any advanced degree that you may have pursued. So, um, so there are test waiver opportunities. 
Uh, and what I'm going to do here is just give me one second. I'm going to copy and paste into the chat function. Um, so this first link is for our application components. So has details about our application components in general, but that will go directly to the, the test score section of that page. Um, the second link is to our test waiver policy for the test waiver policy for the full time program. So I will address now that unfortunately the uh, deadline to submit test waiver applications for the full time program um, has passed uh, as of a couple weeks ago. Uh, so we're no longer granting or or, or reviewing full time test waiver applications for this admission cycle. Um, however, I did want to share that just so you get a general sense of what it was uh, and. Uh, while nothing is set in stone for next admission cycle or admission cycles after that one, um, uh, this process will likely be the same next year. Um, that is subject to change, but in generally speaking, the, the test waiver policy as well as the process to potentially be granted a test waiver for their full-time program is likely gonna be very similar to, to this next year, uh, next, next admission cycle. Um, and then lastly, the, the flex and flex online test waiver policy is a little different. Um, it does not require you to submit any sort of um, uh, additional application or anything like that. Ultimately, if you, if you fit the criteria, if you, if you meet the criteria that's listed on, on uh, the link that I just sent, the third link that I, that I sent, and um, you can ultimately submit your application without a test, there's going to be some uh, that criteria will also be listed in the application, the MBA application itself, and you will be basically required to like attest that you meet those, uh, you meet the, the criteria. And then um, if you if you don't meet that criteria and you submit your application without a test, then um, we might you know proactively reach out to you and let you know that you're you will likely need to you don't meet the the criteria and you would have to submit a test to complete your application. So. Um, so I want to share those links there. If you have any questions, feel free to you know, put those in the Q and A box. So, uh, years of work experience. So, um, first to define like what um, what years of work experience is. This is commonplace across MBA programs, at least within the U.S. Um, given that we all have to have a a uniform uh, can't think of the right word right now, but calculation of how we define. Uh, a, a, a uniform definition, that's what I'm looking for, uniform definition of what years of work experience is, because this is a, st a statistics that's used for ranking organizations like the Financial Times to evaluate, you know, the top 100 MBA programs in the U.S. Uh, so this is just one of various different criteria that's used and has to be uniform, it has to be uniform across all programs. So anyways, that out of the way, um, years of work experience is defined as any full-time paid work experience after earning your bachelor's degree. Uh, the average years of uh, you know, full-time work experience that we see year over year is about five years. Um, it's not necessarily unique to Georgetown, honestly. It's, it's very much reflective of the MBA market where about five years after you know, working full-time, uh, many people are ready to make that next step in their career. And a lot of times an MBA is, is a natural next step for them. So, um, but like I mentioned earlier in, in, in my intro, there's uh, we see a wide range of, of, of uh, applicants when it comes to years of work experience. We have some students that uh, have 10, 15, even more than 15 years of, of, of work experience before they enter the program. In some rare cases, we have people under two years um, uh, of work experience, but uh, ultimately we wanna see you have at least two years of work experience before you, you enter the program because we very much value the amount and the quality of work experience that you have, as you'll need to really rely on that pretty regularly um, in order to participate in the program, everywhere from uh, using a past work experience uh, and embedding that into a group project uh, to simply raising your hand in, in class and, and, and sharing about an experience that you had from, from, your, from your career. Because um, depending on the class, some, 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 some professors will require uh, class participation as, as part of your grade. So. Uh, and then last thing I'll mention is uh, when it comes to uh, your resume, which, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail in a second, but uh, if you can highlight any sort of progression and leadership in your resume, that's certainly something that, that we look for and we like to see. We understand that every single industry is, is a little different when it comes to job titles, 
uh, promotion opportunities and things like that. So we're not necessarily like keeping count of how many promotions somebody got or anything like that. But um, if you can show, you know, signs of progression and leadership throughout your resume, um, that's something that we, we certainly like to see, uh, as well as if you can quantify anything. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll share more information about that in, in a second. So. All right, so uh, as far as qualitative measures, so things that you cannot quite quantify. Uh, so recommendation. So um, you are only required to have one recommendation submitted. Uh, we strongly encourage that it comes from uh, your direct supervisor. Uh, so they can talk about things like most recent work accomplishments, daily tasks, your general attitude in the workplace, how you work in groups and, and things of that nature. So, um, and we strongly encourage that you only have one recommendation. And the reason why I, I, we, we share that is that um, with anything in your application, uh, we want to ensure that we're learning something new every time that we're, we're looking at a, a different piece of, of, your, of your application. So um, if you have, the only time I, I would really recommend having, you know, a second recommender is if you know, recommender one and recommender two can talk about you in very different ways. So, um, and ultimately they can offer different information about you. So you may have gone through some sort of career change. Uh, I'm just throwing out an arbitrary example that, that, that would be relevant for this. Um, you could have worked in accounting right out of, of your bachelor's degree. Uh, and you've realized after a couple of years that that wasn't for you. Um, and you wanted to go more into like nonprofit work. Um, your former supervisor from accounting and your current supervisor from your nonprofit work probably have different perspectives of you, given that there's a chance that the, the, the work that you're doing between these two jobs uh, are very different. Um, so ultimately these two recommenders could offer new inf different information than, than one another. So that is a scenario where I, you know, using two recommenders could make sense. Um, but ultimately we really strongly that encourage that you only provide one um, because we want to ensure that we're, we're only, we're learning new information and we don't want, you know, uh, you know, a, a direct supervisor and a former supervisor from the same organization writing recommendations for you when there's a likelihood that they're going to be saying the same same things about you. Uh, ultimately want to learn as much new information as possible. Uh, and then as far as using a direct supervisor as a recommender, um, we certainly, that's certainly very preferable and we strongly encourage because we want to get the most recent version of you in the form of recommendation. So, um, but we understand that there are certainly scenarios where that doesn't make sense and it's perfectly okay to use a different person for your rec uh, recommendation, like a former supervisor, uh, or even a client. So I'll, I'll explain why now. Um, so it might not make sense for someone to use a direct supervisor if they, um, and they've had their direct supervisor for a matter of a month. Then you've only known this person for about a month. However, your uh, former supervisor you knew for like six years. So it might make more sense for that former supervisor to complete your recommendation. That's totally okay. Um, you might not want your direct supervisor to know that you are pursuing an MBA. That is okay too. Um, that in that case, you know, using a former supervisor might might make more sense for you. Uh, or you might have your own business and you are your own boss, so you don't have a direct supervisor. Uh, so in a scenario like that, uh, maybe having a client uh, submit a, a recommendation, so you can we can understand how you interact with um, you know. An outside organization, for example, uh, that that could be an option for you. So, if you're not using a direct supervisor, ultimately, what we want you to do is submit an optional essay just to explain why you chose the recommender that you did. Again, we don't want to be left guessing. Similar to my my example about uh, transcripts, um, we want to ensure that um, we want to ensure that you know we're we're not left guessing, and we understand why you made the choice that you did uh, in this particular case by not using a a, uh, a current supervisor. So um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen really quickly. My computer's bugged out. So give me one second. And I was afraid this would happen. Okay, hold on.
Okay, sorry about that. So um, quick housekeeping item. Can you see the slide that says recommendation just by so, show of hands slash, uh, okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. All right, let's keep rolling. All right, so uh, personal essays. So you will be required to submit one written essay in one uh, video essay. So the uh, the written essay, it, you'll ultimately be given three different essay prompts and you just need to reply to one. As far as length, there's I think there's about a 350 word, uh, uh, 350 word limit. Um, so not incredibly long. Typically I see these essays that are about uh, tops two and a half pages long, double space. So, um, so you're not, not incredibly long in length, but definitely take your time understand what these prompts are, get a general idea of what you want to write about, um, you know, well before submitting an application. Uh, but yeah, you're given three different essay prompts and you just have to answer one of them. And uh, those prompts uh, are, are, the specific prompts are, are on our website. They're in the first link that I sent you. And uh, they range everywhere from like leadership, uh, like talking about like a leadership uh, experience that you had to uh, how you, you know, thought about others before the bottom line, before thinking about yourself and the bottom line and things of that nature. So, uh, but yeah, all the prompts are there on the website as well as in the application itself. And then uh, we have a one minute video essay uh, and the prompt is here on the screen. So describe a, a hobby, passion or what you do for fun in your free time and why. Um, ultimately we want to get to know you on, on, a, on a more personal level. Uh, and uh, we want to ensure that the MBA experience is a very well-rounded experience and that you're not completely you know, bogged down in all things recruiting, all things academics. Um, there are certainly times in the MBA uh, program where we dedicate time for you to really disengage from the MBA program, everywhere from like sporting events, um, fun club involvement, like our gourmet society where you try out new restaurants, things like that. Um, so those are just two very, very anecdotal, uh, you know, it, uh, uh, you know, examples but um we feel that this is somewhat of a reflection of of that in, in the mba experience but anyways we want to get to know you more on a personal level and um ultimately it's, it's a one minute video and again we want to learn something new about you uh and uh if you're we we would recommend not sharing anything that is like on your resume already because we already have that um however if, if something is you know a passion of yours that is on your resume yeah, definitely go for it. Um, but definitely elaborate beyond what is just on your resume. Because again, we want to learn something. We want to learn something new. And uh, as far as the what you are being assessed on, um, you're not being assessed on production value. Uh, and we're really more so concerned about just like the content of where you're talking about. So as long as we can hear and see you, that is all we need. So if you have like a blank white wall behind you or a brick wall, and you just talk to a camera for a minute, that is okay. And of course, we can see and hear you. That's 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 what we need. Um, you do not need to feel the need to get overly creative with various different like transitions between shots or hiring some like film crew to like film your video. I've seen it before. It's great, um, but definitely not required. Um, so uh, as long as you, you talk to the camera for a minute and we can hear and uh, see and hear you clearly, there's no like distractions or anything like that. You have a blank white wall or, or brick wall behind you, that's perfectly okay. All right, an interview. So um, interviews go out on a, uh, interview invites go out on a rolling basis and on a uh, 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 invite basis only. So not every single applicant will, will, will interview, but if you are invited to interview, you'll be notified via email. Uh, and the interviews are, um, Conduct, would be conducted either by an MBA staff member like myself, a former MBA staff member, uh, an alumni of the program, or a current student. Um, and depending on the round, so this next round is coming up, round two, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, our interviewer pool uh, is probably about 65, 70% student, current students. So if you are invited for an interview in round two, there's a, a good likelihood that you'll you would be interviewing with a current student. Um, the interviews are, are 30 minutes long, treat it uh, professionally, uh, just like you would any other you know, job interview. And uh, yeah, they're, they're 30 minutes long and they can be done virtually. And um, we also have some in-person options as well, where you can interview um, 
uh, on campus uh, in our in our office or uh, potentially in a city near you. So I know in round two, we haven't put anything set in stone yet, but uh, we could be doing some interviews in New York City as well as potentially in India and South America. We'll, we'll have to see what the, the applicant pool looks like, but um, but yeah, there, there could be some opportunities where we might be in a city near you where you could potentially interview in person. All right, so hopefully after this, you're you're ready to submit an application. So you did it, now, now what? So um, after you submit your application, uh, your application will be processed for completion uh, by our operations team, which I'm a part of. Uh, so basically what that means is that before an application can go from, uh, can go to the admissions committee uh, to be reviewed, we have to ensure that every single application component is submitted and complete. So um, if any component is, is missing or incomplete, you'll be notified and we'll let you know like how to submit those items and all that. So once your application is complete, you will, um, you'll be forwarded along to the admissions committee for review. If you're invited for an interview, you'd be notified via email. Um, and then ultimately you will receive a, a uh, decision letter on the decision notification date of the round that you are in, which I'll, I'll go over those, um, those application deadlines and, and dates in, in a second. So, um, so certainly back to missing anything. So if anything's missing from your application, again, we'll, we'll notify, but just to give you a general sense of common things that we see missing when, when an application is, is processed is, um, you know, a recommendation might not be submitted. Um, if someone is submitting a GMAT score, um, you'll be shocked, but we see so many GMAT score reports that do not include someone's name on it. So we need to ensure that your name, your name is on it and we, that the GMAT score report that you're submitting is yours. Um, when it comes to transcripts, sometimes we see transfer credit grades that are missing. So we'll need, uh, you know, uh, grades, classes and grades from that, you know, transfer, uh, transfer school. Uh, we'll see that, you know, transcript PDFs are illegible. We'll see that a uh, transcript uh, doesn't include a grade scale or the applicant did not include a grade scale. So things of that nature. So definitely take your time in the application itself where there are sub requirements sub requirements to these requirements. So like with a test score report, sub requirements include your name, test date and test scores as an example. Um, so definitely go through those, making sure like the PDFs that you're, you're attaching to your application include all that information um, before submitting your application because um, if anything's missing that could affect the review of your application and uh, could affect the timing of the review of your application. Again, I'll go in more detail uh, about that in, in a second. All right, class profiles. So these are um, just to give you a general sense of what we've seen from our um, uh, our most recent incoming class, uh, our most recent uh, admission cycle. Uh, these are our application numbers, just to give you a general sense of what they were. Um, again, our Flex online program has not launched yet, so we have no numbers to report. Um, but yeah, this should give you a general idea of, of what we'll uh, what what we see and uh, just to give you general you know big big highlights that we've seen uh, we've seen the um, a pretty big increase in international uh, percentages and I I realize actually the, the that percentage there on the left uh, thirty seven percent is is a little off um, for the full time class I, the most in, the most recent incoming class uh, about forty two percent of the student body was made up of um, non-US citizens, which is awesome. So a lot of uh, a lot of different country representation within the program. Uh, I believe as of right now, between every program every year, there are about 46 different countries represented in the program, which is awesome. All right, finances, so the fun stuff. So um, what you see here are the tuition and fees um, from uh, this current fiscal year for the full-time and flex program. Um, I will mention that the, the numbers that you see for the flex program there are very, very high estimate. Uh, this also includes things like what we call indirect expenses. So let's say, for example, if you like took out a loan and uh, loan fees were included or um, as well as like things like uh, um, uh, health insurance. So uh, every student's going to be required to have health insurance. So for flex students, and this will go for flex online students as well, uh, your tuition rates are gonna be the same. You have the same fees and all that. Um, but in particular, like health insurance is something that you can opt out of because uh, all of you are gonna be working full time and the vast majority of employers uh, have health insurance and they offer it. And 
Most of you already have your health insurance through your employer. So um, that is something that can get opt out of uh, that, that the vast majority of Flex students opt out of. And I, I presume Flex Online students would as well. Um, but that's like a $3,500 savings right there. Um, but yeah, so Flex students, you have, as I mentioned earlier in my intro, you, you have uh, flexibility as far as how long you take to, to complete the degree. So um, if you're taking like five years to complete the degree, generally speaking, like you're probably taking one class at a time uh, per, per semester. So uh, ultimately Flex students are being charged per credit hour. Uh, but again, so, the, your, your tuition cost is definitely going to differ from semester to semester, depending on how many classes that you're taking. Uh, but yeah, uh, the numbers that you see there uh, on, the, on, the, on the top right are, are very much uh, very, very high estimate. And then uh, just thinking about, um, you know, funding an MBA and as, as well as thinking about the short term and long term. Uh, so upon submitting an application, all, all applicants will be considered for scholarship. So there's no additional uh, there's no additional like fees or applications that you have to submit to be considered for scholarship. Ultimately, upon submitting your MBA application, not only will you be assuming that it's complete, uh, not only will you be assessed for admission, but also scholarship awards as well. Um, it's very much differed year over year, but generally speaking, at roughly about a third of our incoming students receive some form of scholarship from us. Uh, and then uh, the the organizations that you see at the bottom there are. Uh, organizations that, that, we're, that we're affiliated with and partners with. So um, not only will, let's say, for example, you are, you are awarded a scholarship and you're uh, you know, uh, awarded a Forte scholarship. So the, the scholarship funds are coming from Georgetown University. But in addition to that, you are now what we call a Forte Fellow. And now you not only have the, the network of, of the Georgetown community uh, by being a Georgetown MBA student, uh, but you also are part of the Forte network as well, where you can uh, really benefit from their career, uh, career resources, career development opportunities, different events that they have, uh, and much more. So not only are you part of the Georgetown network as a whole, but you also have this massive Forte network that you can be a part of as well. That is really going to help with career development and, and, and all things recruiting and whatnot. So. Uh, and then also thinking about the long-term, um, you know, return on investment. Let me uh, I'm actually stop sharing my screen really quick and I will share our um, most recent employment report in the chat function. Cool. So um, yeah, our most recent uh, Class of 2022 stats just came out from, from all things employers. So um, basically to give you very, very quick highlights, uh, 96, so those who graduated uh, in the full-time class, uh, who graduated uh, in, in, in May, 2022, 96% uh, of our graduates received an offer with a job offer within three months of graduation. Uh, many of those coming you know, before, before graduation too. Uh, and 95% of our, our graduates uh, accepted an offer within three months of graduation. Uh, and then as far as uh, average salaries, uh, average salaries from the full-time program are a little over $138,000. And then uh, average signing bonus is a little over $36,000. Uh, and that's actually a pretty big jump between the class of 2021 and the class of 2022. Uh, the class of 2021, uh, their average salaries were, um, they were 126,000 or so. Um, and then uh, average signing bonuses were about 34,000. So pretty big jumps in, in both. So, uh, but yeah, I wanted to share that employment report that just came out uh, a few weeks ago uh, for you all to, to reference. So let me get back to the presentation. Let me share my screen. Okay. I'm almost done, I swear. Okay, so application deadlines. Uh, so this is what our application dates look like, our, our, our important dates uh, throughout this admission cycle. Uh, so let's just use round two as an example, just so you get a general understanding of what a given round looks like and when you can expect important things. So round two is our next application deadline. So to be considered in round two, you will need to submit an MBA application by January 5th. Um, 
Starting January 5th, our uh, operations team will be processing applications and ensuring that they're complete. Uh, if they're incomplete, you will be notified of what specifically is incomplete or missing. And then um, if your application remains incomplete for a, a particular period of time, um, you'll be notified with really a final deadline to submit all those incomplete or missing items. Um, if you don't meet that deadline, then uh, your application will basically be put on hold and temporarily moved to round three. Um, and to ensure that your application is reviewed in round three, you want to submit those missing or incomplete items by uh, March 30th, which is the uh, round three application deadline. So anyways, if you're in that scenario, you'll be you know, provided specific deadlines to meet if your application is incomplete or, or uh, if your application is incomplete. But um, assume your application is complete, between uh, January 5th and March 21st, you could be invited for an interview. Uh, so again, those th interview invites are an invite basis only. And um, uh, if you are invited for an interview, that interview invite and interview could occur up until March 21st. So um, we do not uh, go in any particular order when it comes to interview invites for a variety of factors, given that we'll do some interviews in a city near you. Uh, so that comes down to like availability and things like that. So um, just because you are, you know, you might get invited for an interview and interview in early February um, does not mean that you are at advantage over someone that is interviewing, let's say in like early March. Um, so if you're interviewing in early March, doesn't mean that you're at a disadvantage because you're getting, you know, you're, interv you're interviewing later in the, in the round. So, um, so point being, we don't have any particular order that we go in uh, when it comes to, to interview invites. And then um, again, assume your application is complete, uh, you will receive your decision letter on March 21st, no sooner or no later, you get notified via email uh, when your decision letter is ready to view in your application portal. And um, if you are admitted to the program and you decide that you wanna to come to the program, that's awesome. Uh, you have to submit a $2,000 deposit uh, by April 19th. Um, to confirm your spot in the incoming class and basically hold your spot in the incoming class. Uh, and <clears throat> that $2,000 deposit will go towards your first tuition bill. So it's not money that's held up and then you know returned back to you or whatever. Ultimately, you can think of it as like paying tuition in advance where it will get credited towards your, your first tuition bill. Uh, if you are denied admission, unfortunately that would be the end of the road there and we, we welcome you to, to reapply. Uh, if you are waitlisted, uh, we'll give you a specific deadline to uh, confirm your spot on the waitlist to ensure that you know you you do want to remain on the waitlist. Uh, so we'll provide a specific deadline for that and specific steps on how to do that. Uh, and then if, if you if you confirm confirm your spot on the waitlist, you'll be reevaluated in round three amongst the entire applicant pool, um, and uh, you would get an updated decision on May fourth, which is the round three decision notification date. Uh, and that update could be an option to remain on the waitlist. Um, uh, an update that you've been admitted to the program or an update that unfortunately you've not been admitted to the program. So anyways, if you're waitlisted again, uh, then this process will repeat for round four. And then ultimately we'll have a, a waitlist over the summer uh, as there's, there's inevitably there's, there's movement uh, year over year um, during the summer with, uh, you know, incoming students that might have to defer their admission or, or drop out of the program entirely, whatever the case may be. So, and uh, yeah, stay in touch. Um, I know that we're, we have about like 15 minutes left or so. So I do want to get to any questions that you have. And I see there's a lot in the Q&A box. So I'll get to those in a second. But yeah, if you have any questions for us uh, or just want to connect with us in general, feel free to email us at georgetonmba at georgeton.edu. Uh, if we are the not right right point of contact, we can definitely get you to the to the appropriate people. So, um, so yeah, to the q and I know we have about 15 minutes left. So uh here we go. So our uh, first question is, uh, can we still get a uh, GMAT waiver for the full-time MBA program? It looks like this was submitted um, before I, I went over the GMAT section. So yeah, uh, just to reiterate, um, and for those who may have joined late, uh, unfortunately, there's uh, we're no longer offering GMAT, jury, or executive assessment. So standardized test waivers for the full-time program for this admission cycle. Uh, I did share uh, the policy in the, in the, um, the link to the, to the policy in the, in the chat function. In the, in the chat box. And um, it was just a way to show like what, what the policy was as well as um, I, nothing set in stone yet, but I'm fairly certain that this process is gonna look 
very similar, if not the same, in, in the next admission cycle. So, um, but yeah, unfortunately, the, the deadline to submit um, a full-time, you know, standardized test waiver application has passed as of a, a few weeks ago. Uh, yeah, okay, this is a great question. So this is um, relevant for, for any, uh, for, for some Indian applicants. Uh, so do you accept candidates with three-year bachelor's degrees, um, three-year three degree from India? So we see this regularly. Um, so if you are, uh, if you are, if, sorry, if you've earned a three-year bachelor's degree from, from India, uh, as long as the school that you attended has a NAC grade of A or above, then we can treat that as a uh, equivalent to a four-year bachelor's degree, which is a requirement for the program. So uh, as long as your bachelor's degree, uh, your, your school, uh, three-year bachelor's degree school has a NAC grade of A or above, um, then, then you, you are, um, you're eligible to apply. So. Uh, if we are from a biology background, can we do any Coursera course on quant? Um, I think regardless of, of anyone's uh, background with, with um, anyone's background with, with, with school or, and or work, um, doing a Coursera course, particularly in quantitative courses, can be helpful. Uh, so I would try to, if you're considering doing any sort of pre-MBA work to prep for an MBA program. Um, I try to treat it in two ways because a lot of people do them just to boost their application, uh, which is fine, which is good, but I try to be a bit more pragmatic about it and um, try to kill two birds with one stone. So uh, it might be more helpful for people to uh, take Coursera courses, let's say in a, uh, in a financial modeling class that could help them with their their quantitative work for, for any MBA program, rather than doing that in like the fall before a program starts, maybe think about doing that in the spring or the summer before an MBA program starts. Um, because ultimately you want that information to be as fresh as possible before you start an MBA program. So um, you wanna find that, that nice balance though of understanding of like where you are in the admissions cycle uh, with a particular program and um, making sure that the, the information that you're learning isn't going to be, um, uh, you're not gonna lose it uh, before you start an MBA program. So I think spring is kind of like that sweet spot where uh, with, with many programs, uh, if, if you're like on the wait list, for example, um, at any program and you wanna boost your application, that could be a good time for you to take some sort of quantitative prep course, which could be through Coursera. Um, to not only strengthen your application, but also like if you are to attend an MBA program in the fall, in theory, a lot of the information they're going to be learning will still be relevant when you uh, when you um, uh, join an MBA program. Sorry, I see a lot of questions here. I know we're limited on time, so I'm I'm trying to find uh, questions that are. Um, most relevant for for everyone. Um, so I've seen a few questions about application fee waivers. Uh, so for this particular event, I'm actually I should have looked this up beforehand, <laughs> but um, uh, definitely not an application fee waiver for this particular event. Um, I'm not 100% sure certain. Uh, some of our events uh, um, are subject to an application fee reduction. Uh, this one might be. I, I'm not entirely sure. But um, ultimately, you will get a follow up email after this event, probably within like, you know, three, four, maybe five business days. And um, you will be probably given a survey. So if this is subject for an application fee reduction, uh, you will um, have a survey to complete. And once you complete that survey, the, the recommendation or sorry, the application fee reduction code uh, will, will appear. So um, complete that survey save the code and they can use that uh, when, when, when you apply. And then uh, just in general, as far as our application fee waiver and reduction policies, uh, if you go, I'll just, I'll just link it again. Uh, give me one second. Uh, 
Uh, that link there will include all of our application fee reduction, um, fee reduction and fee waiver policies as far as like what criteria uh, constitutes what. So, um, so yeah, all that information is there. All right. Oh, that's a good question. So um, for consortium, so anyone applying through the consortium, uh, they require two letters of recommendation. That is their requirement. Um, will we read both recommendations? Sure. Yes, we'll, we'll definitely read both. Um, so it would be pretty unfair for us to not review both. Uh, <laughs> but um, but that's a consortium specific requirement. But we'll for that that's basically an exception. We'll we'll we'll, we'll certainly review both letters. But like also overall, like if if you're not applying through the consortium and you're applying just directly through uh, our program, um, if you submit two recommendations, we're we're definitely we're still going to re review both. Um, I'm just saying as like a general best practice as far as what we like to share, what we like to see. Um, Generally, we if we're seeing two recommendations, ultimately we want to learn something new from both recommendations. Uh, so that's why we, we strongly rec recommend just one um, in, in, in the majority of cases. But yeah, if you're, if you're submitting two, two recommendations, we're, we're, we'll definitely review both of them. Uh, our admissions decisions also released on a rolling basis. So um, if I go back to this right here. So um, ultimate, so the short answer is no between rounds one through four. Uh, so we have four decision release dates, December 8th, March 21st, May 4th, and May 31st. So um, depending on when you apply, you would get decision notification dates on these particular dates. Now, over the summer, uh, we have a wait list, and that's when decisions will go out on a rolling basis, because that's really when we're um, trying to balance the, the number of, you know, acceptances, as well as uh, inevitably, there, there's some people that, you know, personal circumstances come up, and they have to, you know, defer admission, for example, and start not in fall 2023, but in fall 2024. So, um, we will do like rolling admissions at that point of the year. Uh, we typically don't disclose any sort of specific dates during that time period, given that that time period is very, very, very fluid. Um, but we we can, depending on the scenarios, we might be able to give you at least like a final day of when you would expect to receive a decision. But um, so the short answer is no, we don't do any rolling admissions between rounds one through four. But um, if you're on the wait list during the summer, then that's when a rolling, um, uh, rolling decision release will, will, will come into play, so. Time check, okay. Oh, this is a good question. So um, I'm sorry, there's a lot of these in here. I'm trying to get to uh, the ones that are going to be relevant to as many people as possible. So um, so how much time does the recommender have to send the letter? So um, something I forgot to mention uh, operationally about like what these recommendations are. So um, recommenders are welcome to submit a letter. However, um, Ultimately, to complete the recommendation requirement of the application, they have to submit uh, a recommendation form. So basically how it works is when you, um, when you are in the recommendation section of the application, you'll be asked to enter in your recommender's information, like first name, last name, email address, and some basic stuff like their title and all that. Uh, so once you complete that section, uh, an automated email will be sent directly to your recommender. And uh, it'll have some brief instructions on, on what to do, essentially. And uh, it will have a link to your recommendation form, which is unique to you. Uh, it has your name on it and some basic information. So we know that it's, it's your recommendation form. Um, that recommendation form consists of some required fields what, that are multiple choice questions, uh, questions that, that require open-ended text to, to reply to. Uh, so ultimately, to complete the recommendation requirement of 
the of your application, your recommender will have to complete all required fields and submit the form. Now, if they prefer to just submit a letter, that's perfectly okay. How they go about it is if um, they, they can attach the letter to the bottom of the form, there's like an optional attachment section. And um, if they don't want to rewrite their response to like what they already mentioned in the letter, uh, they could simply type in see attached letter just so they complete the required field. They do not need to feel obligated to answer a question again that's already answered in the letter itself. So um, I forgot to mention that as far as uh, as far as uh, logistically how that that works. So all right. Um, oh, that was a great question. So this is a little um, non-application related, but certainly definitely relevant just about like the MBA experience in general. Um, so is the global career track and global experience the same thing? Um, can you speak a little about more about them? Do you know what locations upcoming um, they'll be headed to? So yeah, so uh, part of the curriculum, a required curriculum of the program is a is a international consulting project, which is called the Global Business Experience, otherwise known as GBE, uh, where you'll be given a real life client with a real life problem. That client's not based in the United States. You work with that client throughout um, throughout the entirety of a semester. And about halfway through, you will travel to that client's site and you'll present your findings on the project that, that you're working on. Um, locations and clients vary year over year because uh, one client one year, our MBA students might solve the problem that they're <laughs> that they're looking to, to get solved. So they, they no longer need the help. So um, so the, the, the locations and the clients will certainly vary year over year. Um, but past locations and, and there will be some repeats as well of the, the locations for this year. I don't, don't believe have been announced yet, but um, past locations have been like Panama City, Panama, Bogota, Colombia, uh, Shanghai, China. Um, uh, UAE, uh, Johannes, um, South, Johannesburg, South Africa, uh, and, and the list goes on. So, uh, and then different clients that we've had have been uh, companies like Anheuser Busch. So, if you're looking into a beer, uh, we've had people consult for uh, agricultural sustainability companies. Uh, we've had uh, students consult for uh, Panamanian coffee companies. So, uh, lots of different opportunities. Uh, ultimately, there, there are going to be a lot of different options for you, uh, for, for anyone heading into the program. Starting in fall 2023, the uh, you would be doing, as a full-time student at least, you'd be doing the, the GBE probably, uh, or not probably, you would be doing it in the spring of 2025. Uh, so a lot can change between now and then as far as like different client availability and all that. So to answer your, your question again, sorry, I just want to explain like what those were. So GBE, or Global Business Experience, is different from Global Career Treks. Uh, these career treks are purely optional. These are international career-related travel opportunities for you to have to gain more experiential learning opportunities. So uh, this could be you traveling to somewhere like Tanzania and you help consult for small businesses there and help them through like making their finances more transparent. We had a group of students that did that uh, a few years ago. So uh, those tracks will, will certainly vary from year to year too, depending on uh, availability, client demand, uh, Georgetown connections that might be able to bring up new opportunities and things of that nature. But so global career tracks, purely optional, global business experience is uh, required the capstone course of, of the entire program. All right, so I know we only have about one minute left. I'm sorry, there's a lot of questions in here. So I'm gonna to try to get to one more and then uh, we will we'll call it a day. So uh, let's see. Oh, great question. Okay, so um, STEM designation, that's something that hasn't been brought up yet. So uh, the, MD, uh, the MBA degree STEM designated, uh, and it's eligible for anyone that is in the full-time Flex or Flex Online program. Uh, if you are in the Flex Online program and you are considering getting this STEM designation, uh, keep in mind that 
to earn the STEM designation. Some of the classes that you're required to take are on campus. So that is something that you'd want need to consider and ensure that you're in the area for. Um, but essentially how it works is uh, to earn the STEM designation uh, with your MBA degree is that you just have to take a certain set of electives uh, for to earn that STEM designation. So this is really uh, helpful, particularly for any international <clears throat> students that want to remain in the US after uh, graduating from the MBA program for an extended period of time. Not only will it make them a bit more marketable as far as uh, being marketable to, to uh, employers, but also like practically, uh, they would be eligible to uh, be able to stay in the US for a longer period of time. I think upwards of like three years. And um, who knows if, if you do really well with that employer, they might extend you, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, ultimately you take a certain set of electives um, to earn that STEM designation. And it's a, uh, you can earn it as a flex student, full-time student or, or flex online student. So anyway, so I'm sorry that I, I wasn't able to get all the questions. There's only like 25 that are queued up here. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to connect to what, with us. We'd be, we'd be happy to help. Um, but yeah, I appreciate all you all coming. I hope you learned something new today and I hope you all have a great day. Thank you.